Welcome to an artist chat uh, from Jam on the Marsh. Uh, I'm Edward Armitage, the chairman of Jam, and I'm joined today by the composer Paul Miller, conductor Michael Bortry, and the pianist John Frederick Hudson, who have all been involved in the first performance and filming of Paul Miller's uh, piano concerto. This is a piece that was co-commissioned between Jam on the Marsh and the North Wales International Music Festival. Due to the crazy COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves in, instead of being able to do it to a live audience, we recorded it in a church and it was, um, it was broadcast to the world a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, Jam initially talked to Paul about commissioning this piece after we had given the, I think it was the second performance of your second symphony, wasn't it, Paul? That's right, that's right. Um, which we did in, in New Romney uh, a year ago. And we felt that commissioning a piece that was uh, for instruments um, about Romney Marsh was a, a really exciting idea because Jam on the Marsh is based on Romney Marsh. So Paul, um, would you like to jump in here and talk a little bit about the writing process and how, how you approached it? Yes, thanks, thanks, Ed. It, um, the, the, the piece had a number of, 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 of um, uh, strands that came together for me as an idea. One was that in the three symphonies that I've written so far, uh, the piano has had a kind of starring role uh, and a supportive role, but not a soloistic role. Um, and so it seemed natural uh, for me that uh, the piano should now, now that it's been kind of supportive and, and, and had its moments in the symphonies, actually have its own, um, uh, be, the, be in the centre stage, as it were, be, be in the forefront. Secondly is, um, I'd worked with John uh, many times uh, and he uh, premiered my first symphony, the piano part, and so that seemed right that uh, he'd be the person to, to play it because um, uh, he and the, he's seen um, how difficult the, the piano writing is in my other symphony, so it seemed that he, that he kind of knew what he was getting into, as it were. Uh, um, the, the third is that you know, I've been going down to Romney Marsh for many years at the festival, you know, with you, Ed, and, and, and everybody involved, and, and I kind of got to know the place a little bit in summer, uh, but not in, in winter or autumn, um, and so I wanted to experience that. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about how that came about. Um, and then finally, I've been reading this wonderful book by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. Um, Rachel Carson was one of the first um, women uh, major scientists to look at um, the impact of pesticides on the ocean and on uh, marine life. She was a marine biologist, one of the first women, she was born in 1907, uh, American. Um, and she wrote three amazing books that are poetic books about science and won all sorts of awards. Um, and was at the time um, completely destroyed by all the scientists saying she was talking a load of nonsense. Well now, of course, she's been proven to be absolutely right in almost everything that she wrote about. Um, but so Silent Spring has this wonderful line in it, which just reminded me of, of, of Romney Marsh, you know, and I think I can remember it. For all at last return to the sea, to Oceanus, the ocean the river, like the ever flowing stream of time, the beginning and the end. And that's how the book finishes with dot, dot, dot. And it seemed a very poetic a glimpse of the ocean surrounding Romney and everything being connected to it, to, uh, to Littleston, where, where, where I wrote the piece. And so, uh, thanks to you, Ed, I, I, I kind of drove down from Scotland to your, your place there on the, uh, on the marsh and actually spent five, six weeks uh, writing the piece um, and experiencing the marsh in winter, which I'd never done. Um, uh, which of course is a completely different experience. And in the middle of all this, um, we had Storm Dennis, of course. Um, and so um, Mr. Dennis makes, uh, makes his um, self known in the middle of this concerto. It might be worth um, just explaining to people that, that Romney Marsh is an area of reclaimed land uh, that was drained hundreds of years ago. But of course, as the, the sea levels rise and, and all the craziness goes on in our world, it is absolutely not inconceivable that at some point this this land and these are amazing there are 14 medieval churches across Romney Marsh and these could actually be returned to the sea uh, at some point and it, it, uh, it as I, I'm actually sitting on Romney Marsh as we speak uh, it's a slightly nerve-wracking feeling um so Paul did did you write the piece with with John did you, I did you did you just write a piece and give it to John or was there real collaboration 
Yeah, there was there was real collaboration. I mean, I, I, I sketched some ideas before I went to the Marsh. There were a couple of ideas that I'd had. Some actually I didn't use, to be honest. Many of the sketches that I made before I went to stay there, I didn't actually use um, for various reasons. Um, is, is, is that unusual for you, Paul, i.e. To, 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 to have an idea for a piece and that change because of the environment you're in? Is that unusual? That is normally very unusual because I'm normally in the same environments and, and so it's very unusual for that to happen. Um, but of course when you're in a place, you, you, uh, uh, the whole point of being there was to have to absorb and of course if you go down with pre-described ideas, of course that's going to change, isn't it? Because you're, you're in the place. Um, so have, you, have you written other, other pieces not at home, as it were? No, I don't think I have. I think they've always been written, because I've got, I've got a place in Scotland and a place in Wales, and they've always been written at either of those um, uh, places. So nowhere else, really, apart from the, the odd sketch here and there, you know, if you're on holiday or something. But not really, no, I haven't done that. Um, not a whole piece, uh, uh, maybe a section of a piece. Right. Uh, when you're away. Um, but, but not a whole thing, no, no. So I wasn't surprised that it was going to change, and I wasn't fixed with these ideas, because I thought the whole point of, of, the, of the exercise is, is that the place, you absorb the place. And the amazing thing that struck me, and you'd warned me about this, is that the skies are very different. Um, and of course, in the summer, it's kind of hardly ever dark, isn't it? You know, and you've got these wonderful um, lights. But in the winter, you've got these amazing colours, which, which you really don't see. And, and the great place, uh, the thing about your place where I was staying, uh, is that you've got that wonderful lookout right over across the, the, uh, the, the golf course, right, right, you know, right the way along the place. You can see almost the whole marsh, can't you? Um, and so you can see these vast uh, vistas of colours, you know, in the sky. Um, and I quite often stay up uh, really late or get up really early to watch these changing. Um, and that became the inspiration for the opening of the piece, this idea of just a single line, just a, a canvas that suddenly gets coloured. Um, and the, the thing what you find about living there, as I'm sure you know because you do live there, is that um, uh, is you, you really get a feeling, a sense of time. Mm. You really do get a sense of the seasons. You see yeah, very much so. Um, which you don't in a city um, uh, really often. And so I wanted the idea of time beating because I, I was watching all of these colours, but knowing they were gradually going, you know, you can't capture them. Um, they, they disappear. And so I wanted that, that. So at the beginning of the concerto, there is this heartbeat, you know, uh, of, of time. Uh, or even I could hear in the distance ship bells just gradually banging. So as well. So that's all in there as well. Um, and then. Um, just, just when you say about the, 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 those sort of sounds, um, it strikes me that there's a, a very significant part of this piece is actually percussion. And yes. was that always the plan or being here on the marsh, did, did that sort of, the, the, the crashing and banging of Storm Dennis, etc. Did, did that bring on the percussion or was it there from the beginning? Well, the percussion were there, like the three percussions I wanted, I wanted this, I wanted that. Um, so that they, the, the interesting thing in the concerto is, is you, the, the main thing you're dealing with is, is the individual uh, and the group, um, you know, uh, to quote Benjamin Britten. Um, so you're looking at the, the individual soloist and then everybody else. And so how do you deal with foreground and background, the individual with the group, against the group, all of those things. Um, and the interesting thing is because I wanted a, just strings, I didn't want wind brass or anything like that for various reasons. And I thought the percussion uh, initially could act uh, with the piano, because of course the piano is a percussion instrument, and it also could be its own thing with the strings. So you could have three, two, one kind of combinations of things that you could deal with. Um, and so the percussion was always going to be there, but of course it changed what they were doing um, the, the time I spent there. And so uh, they became actually more in the foreground than I ever planned that they would be. I thought that it would be an accompanying instrument, but actually in many ways, they become more important than the strings uh, uh, in the piece, uh, in many ways. So they become kind of like the, the pianist's kind of backup, um, even though it might not feel like that when they're bashing the hell out of Tom Tom. <laughs> but they, they kind of become the kind of body that the piano doesn't have, if you know what I mean. So at, th at this point, um, I wonder if it's worth bringing you in, John. John, are you okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wonder if it's worth bringing you in because um, you came down to the marsh for a weekend quite early in the, the process um, that Paul was here working. And I wonder if it's worth um, bringing you two together as how that process works. You know, I, I always conceive in my head that a piece is written and given to the soloist and off you pop. Um, whereas this sounds like it wasn't that way. Yeah, I think it's what's interesting is, is it's often that way. And a composer has it quite set in their mind what they want and they go, 
here you go. And then you have to make it happen, good or bad, <laughs> whatever it might be. Um, I mean, knowing Paul for you know for quite a while and, and, and spending a lot of time together, I mean, it was really great to come in actually at two points in the process. Um, first, it was quite early on. Uh, I think I came down, Paul, the first weekend you were down on the marsh. And so Paul had things sketched out and some ideas. He had the structure and the form. Um, and so we were actually able to... Um, go to um, Richard and Angie Fry's house and, and they have a beautiful grand piano. And, um, and so we were actually able to try things out. And so Paul said, you know, this is the idea. And, and then we, we were able to play some things. And I said, well, maybe I just tried to offer on occasion some pianistic ways of, uh, you know, maybe how do you have um, traversed from the top to the bottom of the piano very quickly? You can do that many ways. You can do scales, possibly arpeggios, octaves, and just maybe giving a few um, ideas at that beginning stage that Paul, then he went away, kind of worked with. Can I, can I, oh, sorry, Paul. No, that's right, and it's, it's fascinating because I also wanted this piece to be a show-off piece for John as well. So there's no point in me writing against what he likes to do. <laughs> you know? so, so it was useful. He was saying, actually, I prefer to do this. And have you thought about that? And one of the, there, there are two really interesting points that come up early on. Um, one of them was um, in the middle of there's this great big romantic tune, which is you know, shamelessly uh, ro uh, romantic. Uh, um, and so I wrote, you know, I wrote it. And John, John says, this is a lovely tune, but we don't have enough of it. You know, yeah. you could, we could have more of this. You know, I think the tune calls for more. So, so thanks to him, uh, or, or, or uh, is that, um, that, that I actually thought, I'd like to actually develop that much more. So it happens now over the whole register of the piano. Where, where originally, it was just um, a moment in the piece. And so it kind of added a body to it. Um, and also, there was, there was one movement that I'd sketched before I came down to the Marsh, uh, which is a troika, uh, a kind of uh, a, a Russian Christmas dance, which I'd fallen in love with, this tiny little uh, two-minute thing, which was going to happen near the end, originally. Um, and so John just started playing it, and goes, oh, I don't think this fits the piece. And I knew it didn't fit uh, what I was doing. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you've got something in your head. Um, and so uh, I, I, I disagreed with him all the way along until the end when I'd finished the piece and I thought, this doesn't fit in. <laughs> then I took it out. Um, so that was gonna be like a little code at the end. And actually, to be honest, having now heard the piece, um, uh, it wouldn't have fitted in at all. Um, but so Paul, was that literally just gonna be tagged on the piece as it ends now, or was it a complete no. structural rewrite? There was a complete structural rewrite, but it, that certainly was going at the end. Um, uh, in my mind, that, but, but I guess, as I said to you, that's before I went down to the marsh. And of course, I, when I was living on the marsh, I mean, it just didn't strike it. But it, it's, 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 a, it's a gorgeous little tiny uh, mignette, which I'll use at some point for something else. But it but, uh, didn't, didn't quite, didn't really fit this kind of slow growing, almost organic piece. It didn't, didn't fit it. And it's quite an interesting point, isn't it? Have you ever before done that, where you're very set on an idea that then actually gets binned? I have, and it's really funny that my first composition teacher, William Mathias, used to always say, is if you're really completely set on something, or really have worries with something, they probably won't find the, the <laughs> way into the final piece. And he's actually right. So if you start with this, this is definitely what the piece is about, and then you start living with the piece and letting it grow, you often find that that changes in some way. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I've quite often done that, and then but it's often taken a while for me to get to take it out. Because there's a bit of, a, in all composers, any artist, I think, there's this, once you've written something, you know, uh, you, you, you kind of want to try and use it, but you must realise that, uh, and of course you never do, but you must, until the, till the end, if you're lucky, you must realise that you can't force things into think, to, 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 to material. You, you just can't do it, even though you, you don't like losing things. You know? So, John, am I right that you came down to the marsh twice at the sort of <laughs> beginning and the end of the writing period? Right, so I came out at the beginning and you know, that's where Paul and I just talked through ideas and kind of gestures at the piano. And then um, Paul went away and then he, I mean, pretty much wrote the whole piece um, and most of it. And then I came back and then um, was able to just to try bits of it out. And, and so Paul could kind of hear, remember there was one part that's quite dramatic and I think it was more like single notes or, or just a couple of notes. And we just realized it needed a bigger sound. So I think we made it into octaves. And there's one or two places, you know, we, we bumped it up the octave. That way the piano could be heard over the orchestra. You know, one or two places. So was, we just did a little bit of tweaking. But I think what was amazing about this experience is uh, 
Paul actually kind of listened. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and it, was, it was incredible that we actually, because you, you think of with, with a lot of composers, oh yeah, they'll go, oh, that's fine. And they go away, do their own thing. But he actually was a really fantastic collaboration. And, and you know, something that I think, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Paul's very happy with, but I'm also really proud to have been, you know, connected with this. Yeah, I mean, it, I, as I say, I'm fascinated by the, the connection between you two protagonists, as it were. Um, and I, th I think that's quite an interesting journey Compos already. Composition's, um, a funny thing. Composition's a funny thing because we, we have this idea in our head that, you know, there's the kind of tortured genius of Beethoven who, who, who's, who's like poring over these things in, in his head. And I'm sure he was doing that. Um, but not all composers like that. Quite often, and particularly if you, if you read up about Benjamin Britten's writings and stuff, is that quite often a piece is very fluid until it isn't. Um, and that ideas come in and out and yeah okay you've kind of got the overall structure you've got the themes you know the orchestration and stuff but but there's always move, move tight there's always opportunities for things to change and develop and you have to go with those um, and especially when you're collaborating um, and it's a tricky thing collaborating because uh, most most composers tend to be quite um, well I don't know quite um, control, controlling over, over the over the thing and you have to be able when you're collaborating to to let go of stuff and hear what the other person is is saying and taking on board, and that's not easy. Um, well, but it, that that's that's why I'm 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 interested in in this because it feels very much more um, collaborative than I would have expected for this sort of piece. So I mean, I think that's quite an interesting journey that the piece has already taken before we've got it anywhere near uh, the the orchestra or, in the, or indeed Michael. Um, and to bringing you in, Michael, I mean, you, you, I know you do a, a lot of contemporary music, and I wondered if, if you could take us through the journey that, that you do from, you know, here comes a piece of music through the post, from, from that point to standing up in, in a performance, because th there must be a huge, in the same way as there's this collaboration between Paul and John, you then have to take that collaboration on and, and, and almost make it come alive in sort of technicolor. How, how did you go about that, that process and how long had you had the piece sort of before you had to stand up and, and, and conduct? It's an interesting one. Yes, I think I'd had, I had the, the piece probably a month or so before the first rehearsals, uh, which is a good length of time. And it's always, it, as, as you said, it's always very exciting when you get the, um, uh, the score either through the post or through the internet for the very first time to see I mean, you'll probably have some idea of what the the, the theme is or the, the the story behind a piece you, you might have that sometimes you don't have any idea what's coming at all uh, but in this sense I knew uh, that the, the, the concerto was going to be about the marsh a place that I've been and enjoyed hugely at all times of year so I had some sense of what the story in that sense might be told but effectively my job for that, for that month is to work out the practicalities of how do we put this on in the limited amount of time. Time is always limited in these instances. Uh, the limited amount of time that we will have with the orchestra, uh, how will we put this together and how will I go about rehearsing it? What won't need rehearsing initially? What will definitely need sorting out? Obviously in this instance, we have the, the, the issue of the spacing of the players to, to fit with the COVID uh, regulations and to be honest none of us knew what effect that would have on distance we knew again approximately how far people would need to be apart the gist of it was that it was a lot further apart than they would normally be uh, yeah. and have to say in the in the grand scheme of things it didn't cause as much difficulty for for myself for the players as I had imagined it might and that's partly because the acoustic of the church is extremely good and that people could hear but jumping one step back uh, my job is then to look at the score look at Paul's instructions Paul is is very clear with uh, instructions of instrumentation of how he wants the instruments played be it especially the percussion instruments but in this there were some wonderful indications of how the string players should play as well maybe we may get onto those in, in a second but obviously speeds are crucial um, my job is to sit down with the metronome and having never heard the piece you, you can see on the page what it says should be happening speed wise again we had there was a bit of leeway uh, and when, once I've chatted to John a bit some of the speeds shifted ever so slightly uh, and obviously Paul was around for the rehearsal as well and was in agreement with those slight changes but of course metronomes are there to give you a guide and back to Beethoven uh, 
we generally think these days that maybe Beethoven's metronome was a little bit wonky because the speeds that he reckons felt good in his head generally are almost, well, a lot of them are, are, are sometimes unplayable, but this, this, this doesn't have that issue um, of unplayability with the metronome marks. But, um, and then, of course, we get to the day and we know we have the three hours uh, and we have to um, just plan out the best possible use of time and energy uh, to get the best possible result by the end of the end of our allotted slots. Uh, one of the things I'd like to just rewind very slightly on is obviously when when we commissioned this piece and the piece was being written, uh, etc. COVID nineteen didn't really exist. There were, with, with no one's ever thought that we'd be doing something quite as crazy as um, filming and recording the first time it had ever been performed, which, um, you know, is a slightly scary prospect, I'm sure. I, I'm, I'm the guy sign, standing with the headphones on, so I'm not even performing, and it, and it slightly terrifies me, with that concept. Um, given that John and I had been to the church about a month before we recorded it, and we, we'd actually physically put out the chairs because we we genuinely didn't, didn't know whether the players that that number of players uh, I can't, is it tw 23 players in total is it something like that um we didn't know if they'd actually fit in when when we realized that it it could fit in of course we, we wiped our brow and said how marvelous over to you how how big i know you've sort of touched on this already but it, it, it seems to me the idea of, of having people spread out over an enormous not only width but depth when you're used to being you know two players to a desk all this sort of stuff was that initially terrifying as a concept and was it actually better when you got there in the end yeah i think i mean thankfully percussionists are used to being a long way away from things and they they have an amazing radar um which means that they can because they, they can't look up when they're playing that's it's impossible <laughs> especially if you're playing sort of uh tuned percussion you really cannot be watching a conductor um straight on so they have a they have this fantastic fourth or fifth sense uh which tells them first of all where they are in the piece if they've got bars bars rest to count move instrument take instruments with them sometimes etc etc so percussionists i wasn't so um sort of worried about in that sense of the distance String players, this was for the London Works Out players, I think this was the second time that they had played in the spaced out routine, uh, which for string players is very different because they're, they're used to being right on top of each other, sharing desks, one player turning the pages, uh, keeping in touch with themselves visually, of course, and really close listening to the leader up front. So that was, that was going to be a slightly different feel. And I think... Um, the, again, the church acoustic, church acoustic helped greatly with that in that it didn't appear to be problematic as far as listening and hearing what was going on. Um, page turning then does become an issue because I think the, the librarian for the LMP had to do some photocopying of pages because if you've only got one person at the stand and they've all got the same bit of music, if the page turn happens at a moment when you're meant to be playing, there's going to be some silence. Uh, <laughs> so they, they had to, that, and that will be with us for, for quite a while to come that sort of slight, slight rethink on how, how all that works. But, but no, I mean, we, we uh, slightly strangely, I suppose, for a concerto routine, it was decided relatively early, I think, with, with John, that actually to have the piano in the middle of things, rather than as it might traditionally be, sort of behind the conductor and near the audience. As there wasn't an audience, it didn't need to be there. And I think John would may, may, but probably agree that actually being right in the middle of the, uh, of the group felt a bit more like sort of a Baroque concerto grosso, I suppose, where the harpsichord might be. But it did also mean that John was a lot closer to the percussion. Uh, and uh, those of you that have seen the, seen the broadcast already or haven't yet seen the broadcast will, will gather that the percussion and the piano have a lot to do together. And if they'd been an, an, another 10 metres apart, that probably wouldn't have helped matters. Yeah. So we, yeah, we, were, we were able to be creative with the, with the layout. And I think we came up with a, with, a, with a good solution. So that's quite an interesting point, Michael. Are you, are you meaning that if we'd done it with an audience in, in the sort of traditional 
place I, the piano behind you. You think that would have made it harder than, than the way we did it? I think so, yeah. And it'll be interesting to, interesting to see when we can perform it with an audience, uh, whether there's distancing still required then, who knows? Uh, whether actually we stick to the same layout and that's, that's something that can be up for grabs. In many ways, the, the piano part, I mean, Paul's already sort of hinted that the piano part is very integral to what's going on. Yes, it's a standout solo part, but it is also very much part of the percussion family. You wouldn't want the percussion and the piano to be too far apart, whatever happens. So another option would be to have the, the percussion nearer the front, I suppose, but then, then you do get into the issues of, of noise uh, and things being too close to players and things. That's not, not only do we have uh, the COVID regulations to deal with, but there are pretty strict um, regulations to do with how much noise players can experience and things. Yeah. So. But it's quite interesting, isn't it? That, that hypothetically, if we'd been doing this as we'd planned to do it in a building with an audience, would we have set it out that way? That's a, good, that's a very good question. I think, um, I guess we would have had a bit of time probably just to experiment with that. Not that you want to start moving pianos around uh, during a rehearsal, but um, I wonder whether we would have come up with the same solution, actually, uh, yeah, to have the piano in the midst of it. I'm just so, thinking back to the, second, the, sec the third symphony, which we did last year. Uh, jam on the marsh i think the piano again which yes it's not a concerto but it has a busy time yeah uh, i'm i seem to recall we had the piano pretty close to the percussion then as well for for, for, for very similar reasons actually it was exactly the same place I think. it was yeah. very similar was was it a little bit for, i think it was a little bit sort of set further back in possibly the yeah we had a bit more space uh, and to a bit more depth in the in the in the plan i suppose i think she was a little bit nearer the percussion yeah yeah and so were there any other challenges for, for any of you caused by, by COVID? I mean, for, for Jam and John also, uh, for those of you who don't know, Jam, uh, Jam and John worked together as well as John being the pianist. And, and, and for us, there were, uh, shall we say, a large number of problems created by, by COVID, um, which we spent three or four months trying to work through, which was very hard work. But, from a performance uh, perspective on this piece, were there any other challenges that you felt that COVID-19 brought, other than, I suppose, geography and wh wh whether we could be together to do it? Well, there were big issues for <clears throat> Michael and I live in uh, different parts of Scotland, but so, um, of course, Scotland has different rules to, to England and to Wales, in fact. Um, and so we, I think Michael and I didn't quite know uh, even until the last point, whether we'd actually get out of Scotland and get down, because there was a lockdown still hadn't been lifted. But anyway, we, we, it was, so we managed to, to, to get down, luckily, but that was last minute as well, wasn't it? Mm. Um, mm. And, so, and then the, the big thing, that we, for, for me, I'd already written the piece, so my kind of work in essence had been done, uh, in a kind of pre-COVID, if such a world ever existed. Um, <laughs> but the, <laughs> the interesting thing for me, and I hadn't realised this until I arrived at the rehearsal in the morning, is when I was chatting to some of the players, um, who I know quite well, they've done a lot of my stuff, and, and some of the players came up to me and said, look, we're, we're worried for John. And I said, why is that? She said, and one of the, 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 the women in the, in, the, in the orchestra said, well, normally a person does three or four performances before they record a piece, um, and they get to kind of live in it, uh, and then the recording happened. And she said, so we're worried for him that actually the first thing he does is the recording <laughs> straight off, which is gonna sit for at least 30 days. Um, and so, so they were worried for you, John, if you knew that. Oh, I didn't know that, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> no one else was, John. <laughs> <laughs> we were fully confident of you. Oh, thank you, Ed. But, I mean, that's an issue which I hadn't thought about. I don't know, I'm sure you guys have. Well, certainly, I mean, I think that the, the whole um, routine of, uh, of recording concerts for sort of immediate broadcast i mean just thinking of the, of the proms that are going out at the moment as well it's a, it's a very different feel for everybody be it in a huge empty albert hall or st leonard's and hyde where we were it's a very different feel for everybody and actually that all the sort of the usual preamble before a concert doesn't now happen because people are sort of there before the red light goes on and things mm -hmm. and so that there is a different atmosphere and there's no applause so it's nice of course that in the proms that we've been, some of us have been seeing online, that actually the other groups that are in the building have been applauding their colleagues and things. So it's, it's been, so it is, it is a very different atmosphere, which does, which does sort of rub off, I think, on actually the performers as well. There isn't that, um, that there isn't the sort of the electricity of having people there looking at you in the front row um, 
Well, yeah, it, funny enough, that's ur urging you on. Yeah, that was that was something I was going to ask you about because you obviously you haven't got people there, but instead, in ways, almost it, certainly in somewhere like St Leonard's, which is quite small in comparison to the Albert Hall. Instead of having people nearby, you've got camera lenses pointing at you, and uh, I, I think as a performer, I would find that quite intimidating. In 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 the you so, so I, I think I'd feel that, that I almost couldn't breathe because you've got a lens up your nose kind of thing. I'm not sure I even noticed one of the cameras, to be honest, during the entire entire day. Um, it's, well, no, that, they were very, very subtly positioned and uh, a lot of them are very small also. But um, in some ways, it's the microphones that uh, you're more concerned about. The turning of the pages, the noise that that can make, stamping of your feet. Um, there are all sorts of things that sound engineers will get you for. Um, for extraneous noises whereas the vision side of it is is i mean as i say the, the cameras really didn't get in the way at all that's really interesting as a soloist, um i mean it's really quite interesting i probably speak for a lot of the players um we kind of i think experienced a wide range of emotion that day of kind of fear of the unknown uh, not actually have we've studied this piece we've not heard the piece before to wild excitement because it was like the first time we got together and could make music. It was for myself. Um, and you had, you know, Paul and Michael coming down from Scotland. The orchestra had never gotten together to play this at all. Um, I'd never played with this with the orchestra. I only played it with myself at home um, on a little electric uh, piano. And so, you know, and then being able to walk, walk up to a Steinway, which is fantastic. Um, so it actually was, was really, you had no idea what was gonna happen. You had a very small amount of time to, to actually, you know, rehearse this, making sure everything was right, um, and then put it forward so um, to record it. So it was actually, it was, it was very, you know, scary, but kind of that, I like the term wild excitement because you're just, oh my goodness, you had no idea what was going to happen. Um, yeah. But you don't live in that space of life very often. <clears throat> so when you do get a chance, it, it, it really makes living like very exciting. So, so that's really interesting. I'd, I'd like to just move the, the journey on a bit because, of course, one of the other things that's slightly strange about uh, how we've had to do this piece is we've all sat in a building and recorded it, mm -hmm. but we've also then viewed it in a completely different way. So as a conductor, you, you've watched the, the premiere rather than... Con I mean, you've conducted the premiere, but you, then when everyone sees it, you're watching it as well. And, and I know that, that, that John and Michael and I w watched that premiere together. Uh, sadly, Paul uh, couldn't get down, but it's a very strange version of a performance, isn't it? Well, in many ways, I felt, I guess, like a composer might feel at a premiere, in the sense, <laughs> uh, in the sense that you've, you've done your bit. Well, the composer, by the time the premiere comes, there's not much more you can do. And actually, in this instance, by the time that the premiere came on YouTube on, online. There wasn't anything more I could do either. Uh, but did you feel nervous coming to it? No, not nervous. I mean, excited, as I say, yeah. the same emotion as John actually, just to see, because this is all new and, and I think it will be with us for quite a while, this finding different ways of, of putting pieces, for, of doing performances, be they live re sort of recordings or uh, online sort of editing things together from people disparately which is going to have to happen i think for quite a long time but people are finding their way through this and i think it was it's it was great to be able to share that for, at the premiere the fruits of all the labors really uh, a week or two after the a couple of weeks after the recording and it did feel like an event it really did paul you you were in scotland because you were still locked down or re-locked down or whatever situation it was did you watch it on your own or were you with friends or? Yeah, no, we were on a second full lockdown in, in Aberdeen because of a, another outbreak that had happened. So, so that's why I couldn't get, get down to, uh, to be with you guys to, to hear it. And, and, but no, so I was on my own uh, uh, listening to it. But the funniest thing, and the great thing as we were finding out with Zoom, this is a wonderful thing with Zoom, is that you're still connected to everybody. Um, and so I had some friends from America who had zoomed in to listen. <laughs> so so, so there's a whole crowd, and and I was kind of uh, messaging with you guys, wasn't I as well, uh, down in down in in Kent. So I, I didn't feel alone, rather strangely. And that's been a wonderful experience about Zoom throughout the whole thing, mm -hmm. and, and, and FaceTime, and all these wonderful things. I don't want to push one particular one; they're all they're all pretty good. Um, and that uh, is that is that you even though you're locked down, you're still connected um, instantly and I think that's been wonderful. So no, I, I, I was here, I had it, I had, uh, had, had put it on the big screen, I have a big 
uh, that, that screen there and, um, and, and watched it. And I felt that I was there, to be honest. And the amazing thing is, I suppose, out of, out of, because you guys were all working during the, the, the recording of it, um, I was the only one that really kind of wasn't. Um, uh, I, also, I said my initial uh, thoughts. I mean, that kind of it, it kind of took. Shape. You mean in the recording environment? In the actual, actually, in the building. So I actually, heard, I was probably the only people that actually heard it uh, in the building without being uh, uh, frantic, making trying to make sure I think everything's um, working. You know, so so I had heard it. So I, um, and of course, it was some. It was special to hear it again. And of course, what I thought was brilliant about the. The recording is it captured it of course exactly as it was um that's the thing that because i mean thanks to you guys you know uh, for, for for doing the recording because it was exactly as i as i heard it you know uh, and, and so that takes some skill to get the recording right um and get that um as it should be because uh, the slightest thing of course can make it all not sound like that i mean it's a, it's a great skill well i think one of the in other interesting things you were saying about this virtual performance world, whatever we want to call it. Um, I, I found an interesting statistic um, earlier this week about not just the, this concert, but the, the we, we produced nine, nine concerts over, over this festival period. Um, and I think most people, this is a bit of a generalization, but most people would consider a classical audience to be a slightly older audience, um, you know, Bit less hair, maybe a bit grey, um, and we we found out the stats of of audience that have viewed uh, the festival to date, and nearly fifty percent have been aged between eighteen and thirty five. Now I, I I find that very very fascinating because I don't think that is our jam's typical demographic. Um, but one of the things uh, I've, I've felt all the way through, and John and I have talked about this, I think we all have talked about this a bit, is that I feel that there's a new world out there. There's a new audience out there. And of course, leading into this, we couldn't possibly know it to be correct. But for, for nearly 50% of the people who've watched this to be of that age demographic, I think that's remarkable. And, and Paul, how, do, do you feel as as the creator, the initial creator of this piece, the composer, do you do you find that an exciting prospect? Yeah, I do. And to be honest, I'm not that surprised um, because I found this, I had uh, with CDs, uh, with rec we were recording, I had two albums out earlier this year. And the interesting thing, the statistics that came back from the record companies is that the demographic was people over the age of 60 bought the CDs and people under 60 got it from Spotify or iTunes and downloaded it. And of course the downloads far outweighed the buying of the physical CDs. So I think there are a number of issues which the record companies are beginning to realize is that young people don't buy CDs. They wouldn't necessarily go to a concert because they can't afford it necessarily, or they can't travel down to Kent to do a whole week of performances. But they are the, um, uh, I say they, because I'm not quite in the young person category anymore. But they, they are the kind of internet generation. So they are the, the, the kind of the iTunes generation. So their intake of music happens on screen in a uh, totally different way yeah so for them uh, i can imagine well, i haven't spoken to many but, but this kind of thing is 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 a, is a is a dream because it means that they can get all of this music they don't have to pay a huge amounts of money they can give a small donation if they want um and and they can get a whole load of music in their own house without having to move or do anything and that makes a lot of sense to me. so i suspect that, that if, if we do, if you do a roundup next year at the, at the festival for people to who come to the the, the performances our, our regular audiences, we know many of them, and I, I suspect many of them probably haven't seen this online. Um, not because they didn't want to, but because perhaps they don't have access to it, they don't find it easy, I mean, all sorts of things. It's not the way they like to take in concerts. Um, it's very interesting. That word access is really interesting, isn't it? Because on one hand, we've never done anything that's more accessible than this festival because anyone can watch it. It doesn't cost you anything. But of course, that does assume you've got decent internet. Uh, which, you know, may or may not be the case. But I think you're right, Paul, that, that some, some of our more typical audience either are a little unsure of the technology or actually don't want to watch it this way. You know, mm. the part of, of the whole, and, and I think probably all four of us would probably concur that, that nothing beats the live experience. You know, going to a concert hall, and really experiencing it is is just a different kettle of fish from watching it down a screen. 
And, and I think one of the things I found very interesting through this, this last six months is rather than worrying about losing our live audience, I, I'm incredibly excited at the idea and, and celebrating the idea that we're actually finding a completely different audience. Because, you know, down on Romney Marsh, probably the biggest audience we can get uh, into one of our medieval churches is 350 people, say. Well, uh, and, and you have to be able to travel to New Romney or Hyde or wherever <laughs> we are. Well, this is a very different kettle of fish, isn't it? And as, as you were just saying, that people are watching it from, from America um, or New anywhere Zealand. else. New Zealand, the yeah. Faroe Islands, Australia. Yeah, exactly. And and John, did you have something to um, show the the, the 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 folks watching this and and Michael and Paul uh, of the age demographic that that we yes. attracted? Yeah. So um, I was um, sent this um, by a friend who watched this in Cambridge and and re received permission. Um, and so I just want to show this um, to so both. Uh, Michael and Paul have not seen this. So I'm just going to share this and play something for you. So the woman who sent that with her kids said that the kids, they stayed crouched like that in front of the computer, absolutely in awe for 20 minutes. It did not move at night. His fingers, did you see his fingers? They were, he was playing yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was brilliant, I haven't seen that. So, but, but isn't that, again, isn't that a fascinating thing? I wonder if um, the, those children's parents would have brought those age kids to a concert. Um, my guess is, I don't know them, but my guess is probably not. But, but I think what an experience for those kids. I think, yeah, this, absolutely. I mean, it, it's unbelievable that the kids like that are engaging. But I mean, one of the reasons why, you know, the classic, classic FM radio station has been so immensely popular, I mean, getting 8 million listeners and stuff like that, is because um, it, there's now, now particularly among young people, is they just want to listen to what they want to listen to. So, um, you know, we like that or loathe it, and we, the, the views on both sides is that um, now the concert's there, if they just want to listen to the Judith Bingham piece, then right, I'll go and listen to Bingham, or I just want to listen to the Peter Avis piece, or, you know, and they can just do that uh, now, which a lot of people um, are doing, and that, there's a generation of people. It's interesting that, that when I look at the, my recent, one of my recent albums uh, on Spotify, and there's like two tracks that have been downloaded, uh, you know, a hundred thousand times or something and then one which i thought was my best work has been downloaded like three you know so it's, <laughs> it's and like, they're all by you yeah no no i wish i wish <laughs> it's, uh, probably a lot of them at least but it's um it's it's fascinating that the, there's a, there's a whole new way of that younger people are consuming music and, and, and i think classic fm published some statistics where yeah their listeners on on three of the nights that they put out was like from from uh, 16 to 25 were, were like you know a million listeners I mean, who do, I mean, that's fantastic. Isn't yeah, it? it's wonderful. Um, I agree. And, and dare one say that the naysayers that are moaning about classical audience dying on its feet, I, I, I just think they've got it wrong. It just, we, we, we possibly have to change how we present it and, and on what medium. But when you, when you see that, that little bit of video of, of those two children, I don't know how old they were, totally riveted by, you know, by, by this music. I find that, um, I actually find it deeply emotional um, and, and how, how, how thrilling that, that they are the, the future concert goers. Or, and of course, or music at that, uh, and of course at that age for, for the kids, it's a bit like languages, isn't it? I mean, for, for them, there is no difference between classical music, pop music, jazz, Absolutely. it's music. And if it's they like interesting- it or don't. Yeah, and if, if it's interesting and visually exciting uh, and orally exciting, great. It doesn't matter what the genre is at all. I totally agree. We've also found, and I don't know what, what statistics will be on this with, 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 with Jam, I don't know how you'll measure it, is that we found that if we put concerts on there an hour without a break and finish early, we get much more people coming. Um, and I don't know why that is. I can understand with the, when I've talked to some of the older people, they want to get the bus back, you know, um, so they can be back at home. Uh, in a reasonable hour, and it's fascinating. And I, I, it'd be interesting to know if that's had a bearing that they've been slightly shorter concerts this time. Um, I mean, that was something again that that when we were putting the whole program together, that John and I talked about a lot. 
And I think actually sitting in front of the screen, uh, watching a concert for much over an hour, I'm not sure it, uh, how satisfying it is. An hour is fine, but much over that, and you know, you might be wanting to go and get a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, don't I say? <laughs> So just moving forward, because we, we could natter about all this for the rest of time. Um, I think, can, can we have a little talk about future performances of this? Because this piece has been, uh, it, it's been born in peculiar circumstances that no one's actually been in the building, other than you, Paul, uh, when, it, when it's been performed, which is so bizarre and difficult to get one's head around. Um, I mean, Jam will, will will be taking it on and performing it live, assuming we're allowed to perform it in July next year. As, you know, fingers crossed and all the rest of it. And I believe it's going to um, the North Wales International Music Festival. In, is it October twenty one? Yep. Yep. And do, do we do we know if there are any other other performance planned? We do. They're not they're not all confirmed yet, of course, because people are still slightly jittery about confirming. Of course. Stuff. Um, but there's hopes that it'll be done in Scotland, uh, in uh, the Czech Republic, uh, in Poland, and in the United States next year. Um, uh, and these, these are things that, um, apart from one of them, um, haven't come from us trying to organise it. They've come from people having heard the broadcast saying, we'd like to do this. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's been really nice as well. Isn't that another fascinating thing about talk, talk about us all changing how we communicate with each other, that, 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 that orchestras or pianists or whoever it is who want to take this piece on uh, uh, are seeing it, which of course would never have happened if we'd done it in, in a, a church on the Mars, and now say, well, actually, we want to take this on. Uh, yeah, how, how would that have happened prior to this? Well, like, it had to have been, you know, my publisher going around sending it to people and that kind of how it normally happens. But I yeah, think... but that, that, that again, I think is something that, that changes by the medium. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really fascinating. So as we look to sort of wrap up today, is there anything, anything else that any of you want to say um, about this process or, or anything else? Well, it's it's been remarkably for for, for, for me, and I don't, I don't, I'm sure it's not been like this for you guys because you've had to do all the work behind the scene. But for me, it's, it seemed remarkably um, uh, uh, fun. Um, and even though there's been an enormous amount of work that you've all been doing, I can see some faces there. Um, but it, the whole experience has been a good one, I think. Even though it's probably been more work than you guys would have imagined, it actually has been a positive one. And, and I don't think any of us thought or that it necessarily would be because of all the problems that there are around it. We thought it might be a bit of a slog. I'm sure we all thought that, even though we maybe didn't say it to each other. But actually, even though it was hard work, I'm sure for you guys doing editing and stuff, the end result, I think it was very positive and it's been a positive response, especially from reviewers and from people sending emails and letters and things. I mean, they've all been extremely positive. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, it's the same, it's almost back to the same thing, isn't it, of, of, of this change of medium. Um, I, I think that, that back in March, when we were conceiving the idea of doing these concerts um, this way, I think it was almost with a there I say negativity, um, and actually, as we've been sort of sucked down this this tube to the to performances and then releasing them, I actually think I agree with you, Paul. I think it's been a very positive thing, and I think just reaching out to different people, whether it be those beautiful children or people around the world, I think is a remarkably exciting thing to do. That said, I can't wait to be getting back to doing live concerts as well. But I think, well, I think, I mean, the, I think the, the future is a combination of the two, isn't it? Um, totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, I mean, I, I think ev even in small little jam world, I think that, that next year's festival, there will be three or four that we film and the rest will be live. They, even the ones that we film will be live. We'll just have to work out how we do it in a way that's not intrusive in a, in a smallish building as opposed to you know, the Albert Hall where you can be you know, 80 feet away from anyone. Um, good. Okay. So I think that pretty much wraps up our conversation today for our, our chat with our artists. It feels like a behind the scenes uh, sort of chat. And I think that's really interesting. 
So thank you everyone for, for joining us. I'd like to re remind people that these events, all the events, the, the, the concerts, nine concerts and free exhibitions are available for free uh, at jamconcert.org uh, until the 11th of September. Um, as I said, they are free, but should you feel an urge to relieve yourself of any money, then donations would be gratefully received. Um, it's worth noting that it's cost a huge amount to, to create this festival with no projected income whatsoever. Um, so the donations are hugely, hugely important. Um, and I'm delighted and incredibly grateful for everyone who's uh, donated to date. As I say, all of these events are available until the 11th of September. So from me, from Paul, from Michael and John, thank you for watching and thank you chaps for joining us and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.